Our next speaker is a Stanford MBA graduate and Gleitzman Fellow at the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard University and the co-founder of the Aboriginal Professional Association of Canada. Please welcome to the stage, Gabrielle Scrimshaw. Bojo, glani de si Gabrielle Houchet. Growing up in a small Cree community in north central Saskatchewan, my family lived about a mile away from our small town's powwow grounds. So every summer in early July, usually on a stormy and wet weekend, when we could hear that persistent and beautiful drum of the powwow echo over the plains, my sisters and I would put on our rubber boots and start to walk down the road through the dirt and the grass towards the powwow. There we would sit on bleachers arranged in a circle while watching these beautiful Plains Creek dancers move within the circle in front of us. For me though, as the youngest daughter of an artist, I really enjoyed walking around the peripheral of the powwow grounds because that's where you would be able to meet with different indigenous artists. Artists who would have these makeshift booths and move from powwow to powwow as it moved every weekend. And these booths were usually nothing more than a table with a blanket and a couple of chairs, but on that they would proudly display their artwork. One year when I was 12, I was walking around meeting with the different artists and something unique caught my eye. And so I walked up to this piece and held it up. And it was a hair clip about the size of my hand. And on it, it had every shade of blue and orange I'd ever seen. And it was shaped like a beautiful butterfly. And as I picked up this hair clip and examined it from top to bottom and side to side, I was just amazed at the intricacy and how meticulous all these hundreds of beads were laid down. If you've been to a powwow, or perhaps you've been to an indigenous shop or conference, you've no doubt seen similar indigenous beaded items such as this. And while indigenous you know, designs and techniques for how they use the beads difference, differs from community to community, beading is really a recognizable form of indigenous art all across North America. But you might be surprised to learn that beading, like what we see here today, is actually a rather new addition to indigenous cultures. Well, hundreds of years ago, yes, we did use things like seeds or stone or feathers to use as ornaments. The beading that we see today is mostly using glass beads. And these glass beads were among the first items to be traded shortly after the Europeans arrived meaning something that we all know, see, and understand as an important aspect of several indigenous cultures across North America is actually a rather new addition. The result of indigenous communities adapting to the circumstances and opportunities of the time, updating old tools in favor of new ones. We are here today to talk about technology that is a tool that we now have that is new to us. And when I think about this, this intersection of technology and indigenous communities, I am both excited, but also a little bit terrified. Because in a world where we have things like artificial intelligence, decentralization, ubiquitous smartphone usage, I have to ask what's going to happen to our diverse array of indigenous languages, indigenous cultures, traditional ways of life. In a world that's moving a million miles a minute, are indigenous groups going to be swept aside? Or in a world moving a million miles a minute, will indigenous communities do as we've always done and adapt to the circumstances and opportunity of the time? or put another way, create our generation's digital beads. In Canada, indigenous communities, indigenous peoples were the fastest growing demographic. 
Half of our community is under the age of 30, half of our community is now urbanized, we're increasingly more educated. But as I'm sure many of you know, indigenous peoples in this country today face many challenges. Suicide rates for indigenous peoples are five times the national average. We are three times more likely to experience food insecurity, three times more likely to be unemployed and be underfunded in our quest for an education. Now, 10 years ago, the government of Canada started to think about what steps it could take to right some of the wrongs of the past. And in 2009, the government created the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, the TRC, as it's also known, was tasked with listening and communicating and, and cataloging the stories of the survivors and those impacted by the residential school system. A system that I'm sure many of you know forcibly removed hundreds of thousands of indigenous children from their home, put them in schools where they were not allowed to speak their language or practice their culture. These schools that we now know through the courageous work of the TRC and the survivors that worked with them have led to these really big challenges that we see in indigenous communities here today. A few years ago in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission put out their final report. And in that report, they also put 94 calls to action for Canada and Canadians to start on our shared reconciliation journey. And while many of these calls to action were directed to the government on things that they could do, it's my belief that policy and policy alone will not solve all the issues face facing Indigenous peoples in this country. That you and I also have a role to play in reconciliation. And that technology can also have an exciting role to play in reconciliation. Now, over the last several years, I've been in school studying this overlap of technology and indigenous communities' well-being and reconciliation. And through that research, I've seen that it falls generally into two big categories. Technology for indigenous communities and technology by indigenous communities. As a first example, Connected North is an initiative by Cisco Systems. And using Cisco Systems two-way telepresence technologies, remote indigenous communities are able to access mentor, mental health programs, educational opportunities, mentorship opportunities with people located in other parts of the country. And what's really unique about this is that each individual indigenous community that Connected North works with gets to self-select their own priorities. So they can choose to be as connected or as disconnected as they'd like. They can have mental health services or they can have educational services. It's really up to them. From a reconciliation perspective, I think that's fantastic because you have this large multinational organization saying to these small indigenous communities, here is our technology, tell us how you would like to use it. And importantly, when the community says what they would like, Connected North listens. Now, I've worked with indigenous peoples all around the world, and we represent thousands of languages, of cultures, of, of rich, diverse histories. But what's amazing to me is that across this diversity, we all share the same priority. I don't care if you're talking to an Aboriginal elder in Australia, uh, somebody in Latin America, we all share the priority of language. And that kind of makes sense when you think about it. Because language is, from an anthropological perspective, considered the root of culture, right? It's how we see and understand and interact with the world around us. Sadly, though, hundreds of indigenous languages around the world are considered endangered. But some indigenous communities are using technology to start to fight this trend. In New Zealand, indigenous organization there developed an app called Kupu. Uh, 
Kupu uses image recognition technology so that anyone with a smartphone can take a photo of an object. Kupu then understands what that object is in, in the photo and linking to the world's largest and most comprehensive Terio Maori dictionary, they present you with translations of what that object is. But it's also smart in the way it does this. Because if you take a picture of a red apple, it will not only present you with the word apple, it will present you with the word red, with the word fruit, and other synonyms that could be used to describe that object, therefore allowing the user to have a better and deeper understanding of the Maori language. Here in Canada, there is a website developed by Indigenous peoples called First Voices. And it's an online website that has 13 different Indigenous languages where users can learn um, through different resources, books, and games that they've developed all online. And to make this possible, they also had to develop a uh, text format that would make it possible for learners learning certain indigenous languages to be able to type the correct indigenous syllabics into the computer. Technology is also important for non-indigenous peoples, which is a key aspect of reconciliation. When Canadians ask me, as they often do, what first step they can take when starting their reconciliation journey, my answer is almost always the same, which is learn the history of the land that you're standing on. Nativeland.ca is a very simple website using Google Maps. And what they did was they mapped out all of the treaty areas in North America, as well as in Australia, as well as the indigenous languages and traditional territories. So you as a user simply have to put in your postal code or zip code, and it'll tell you which treaty area you belong to, if any, what indigenous language is spoken around you. So that if you want to start to learn about your localized indigenous history and culture, that this at least provides a starting point. Now, as we start to zoom out and we think globally, there's 370 million indigenous peoples worldwide. We're young, we're diverse, we're growing, but we also have an array of challenges that we're facing. With climate change, indigenous peoples are disproportionately more likely to be climate refugees. Our languages are becoming extinct. Our traditional ways of learning and knowing are also becoming extinct. These are really big challenges. But in this darkness, for me, I think technology at least offers a glimmer of hope. And why is that? Well, in the nearly 20 years that have passed since I saw that beaded clip, hair clip on that table, those same indigenous artists that were selling in those booths have now moved to sell their beautiful beaded work online on Etsy stores or websites hosted by Shopify. And if they also are at the powwow moving community to community over the summer, they're now accepting digital payments using technologies like Square. The point of all of this being that indigenous communities are already using technology. But let's imagine for a second what kind of future would be possible if we were more mindful about it. Right, I can see a future where an indigenous youth in Vancouver, born in Vancouver, can use virtual reality to start to see and understand their traditional territory, where their language comes from, where their ancestors were, and start to deepen that connection with their land. I can see a future where in remote northern indigenous communities, we use drone technology to deliver essential goods and services much like NGOs do in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Thus allowing these indigenous communities to still live their traditional ways of life, if that's what they want to do, but still have access to essential goods like medicine. I'm looking at a room of creators, of innovators, of leaders. As we're thinking about what kind of future is possible 
using technology. I also want us to think about bringing indigenous voices into that conversation. Because while I've talked about technology for indigenous communities, I've talked about technology by indigenous communities, the key point of all of this and the one thing I want you to walk away with is that it's technology with indigenous communities. That by working together and thinking about what kind of future is possible, that we can also collaborate and create these digital beads that will transform the next generation of indigenous peoples. Masicho, or thank you in my language.